I think philosophical progress is kind of slow. Uh, and that's just because the questions are really hard. If we knew how to approach the questions and we were easily able to generate consensus answers on them, then they just wouldn't be philosophical questions at all. Welcome everyone to today's AMA, where we are very pleased to welcome Professor Graham Oppy. He is Professor of Philosophy at Monash University in Australia. His philosophical work focuses primarily on the philosophy of religion, and his books include, not limited to, um, Arguing About Gods, The Best Argument Against God, Ontological Arguments, um, and others. He also has a wide variety of published articles. Feel free to add anything if you like, but with that, welcome Professor Graham Uppy. Thanks. No, I won't add anything. That's more than sufficient. Perfect. So I wanted to start with a kind of general question about what arguments are. And w when I think of an argument uh, in the most, in the least restrictive sense, I think of it as a sort of collection of statements that uh, we call premises some conclusion and some sort of indication that the, the premises support the conclusion. I take it this is roughly the view that David Hitchcock has presented. Uh, is this how you construe arguments or, or, or how would you uh, approach this? Um, so maybe we could back up a bit. I mean, think of um, the kind of more everyday sense of argument. People have an argument when they have a disagreement, then they're trying to figure out how to resolve their disagreement. So, I mean, just to give you a kind of concrete example, suppose that we're supposed to be going into the city, we have to go and catch a train. And you say, we better leave for the station now. And I say, no, we got plenty of time. Uh, and you say, well, look, it's, quarter of an hour's walk to the station we've only got 20 minutes and i say no we've got half an hour so um so so there's a disagreement and there's something at stake that we need to resolve it uh and turns out you say well look my 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 watch says it's 22 and i pull out my watch and say but my one says it's half past uh now, in this case, there's a kind of easy way to resolve it. Obviously, one of us has got some misinformation that's fairly easy to correct. But in general, that's kind of what the nature of argument is, is kind of re resolving disagreements between people. Now, it's true that in philosophy, there's this kind of idea that um, we'll precisify the notion of the word argument in the way that you did so that it means uh, a certain kind of structure. An argument is a set of sentences, one of which is identified as the conclusion and the rest of which are identified as the premises. In a way, that's okay, but it's not clear um, once you say that exactly what role arguments in that sense are going to have in resolving disagreements. Right? in the kind of that kind of everyday sense of having an argument um, and so it's worth thinking about whether it's really the best way to think about what uh, you know, the best kind of formal structure to call upon um, or the best formal structure to give the the, the title argument to so that's just a kind of initial comment. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, that's helpful. Because like, I, I know people have suggested that um, an argument is less of a sort of well-defined, uh, you know, discrete set of sentences connected by inference rules, but more of a, like an activity or something people engage in. Um, is that kind of right? Or do you think that potentially confuses arguments with the activity of presenting arguments? So, so I think you're right that there'll be a conflation going on there. We've now got, we've got a word that gets used in various ways. Right? Our arguments, like many words, has more or less technical uses within philosophy. It has other uses outside. And so just to continue on with from what I said before, uh, maybe there's nothing wrong with 
just saying, okay, we're just going to agree that by argument we mean what we said before, a set of sentences, one of which is identified in the conclusion, the rest of which are identified as the premises. But I do think that if we're thinking about that, but we're also thinking about what use those things are in resolving disagreement, then we're going to come to a slightly different view than the kind of ordinary one about which particular instances of arguments are useful and why they're useful. So you said something else when you were introducing the idea, which was that um, part of what was interesting about, or part of what mattered about arguments was that you kind of had support for the premises or that the premises had some kind of special privileged um, epistemic status. It's not just that the conclusion follows from the premises, but there's something else that you need for a good argument, which is that the premises have some status and we can argue about what that status might be. I'm not sure that's helpful. I think that the, the kind of use of argument in um, kind of resolving disagreement will start with a different idea, namely that when I give you an argument, I'm helping you to see that something follows from things that you already accept, that you didn't realise followed from those things that you already accept. Right, so the status of the premises is kind of irrelevant. All that really matters is this question about the about support, whether the conclusion really is supported by the premises. Uh, the most interesting case, of course, is where the thing that follows is something that's absurd, contradiction or something like that. Because if it turns out that your views are in contradiction or more generally that your views have absurd consequences, then there's something you need to do. You need to set about revising your views in order to make it the case that you're no longer committed to something that's absurd. And that, to me, is the kind of most significant use of the formal arguments in the prosecuting disagreement between people. Of course, Sometimes it'll be interesting just to learn that something that isn't absurd follows from things that you already believe, even though it doesn't generate, so we're not generating a contradiction for you, but just because you learn something or because you'd really rather not believe that thing, right? And so you still have a question about, okay, so there's some revision that I've got to do. Either I'm going to accept this thing or I'm going to have to give something else up. Right. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. And, and thinking on the um, idea that sometimes we can show there's some further consequence, not necessarily the one that's absurd. Um, that happens all the time, especially I like to think of like mathematical proofs, right? I mean, you find some new result, um, kind of, then you can add that to your stock of beliefs, but it's not, it's not, I mean, if you, you might not have to, but um, you tend right. to. So in, um, in maths, almost certainly you will add it because it's very unlikely that getting a result is going to give you a reason to go back and wonder right, whether right. <laughs> their established mathematics is somehow mistaken in serious ways, right? So you do, you do yeah. always have that option, though. That's what you would say. Right? That's right. It's just, I mean, it's it's much more of an option in philosophy, right? <laughs> Where um, well, as soon as you you've got some, but but as you say, just in general, when new information comes in and it doesn't fit with what you already believe, some revisions call for, you don't have to accept the new thing that comes in. You don't have to give up one of the things that you already believe, but you've got to do one of those two things in order to resolve the, the if there's a contradiction. Right, yeah, that makes sense. And it's just, which one we do is going to depend primarily on how strongly we are committed to those premises or how uh, un implausible we find the conclusion or... Well, I guess we should distinguish between what you will do and what you should do. I mean, I guess that what you should do okay. is you should settle on the best resolution, whatever it is. And sometimes the best resolution, often it will be giving up something that you already believe. So going back to my... Um, uh, my sort of toy example about a disagreement. Um, suppose that, um, that um, we pull out our phones and our phones both say, okay, it's 20 minutes till the train leaves. And so we've got to rush off to the station. 
the conclusion that I'm going to draw is, okay, so my watch has stopped or there's, you know, my watch is running slow or something like that. And that will be the obvious thing to settle on. Um, in general, I think for a single person um, that presented with an argument that shows that they're, they're, there's this thing that they're committed to that they didn't realise that they were committed to, it's going to be the same sort of business of trying to think, okay, um, what's the best thing to give up? What's the best adjustment to make to my view so that I end up with the best view going forwards? Wait, sorry. So, so ending up with the best view, does that mean, is that when, is that where we start looking at, you know, a theory in respect to various virtues or? Does yeah, that... yeah, I think yeah, so. Okay. Um, I mean, of course, often you don't have to approach it in that really abstract way. Like it's obvious in the, the case where we've got a lot of evidence that points to, to my watch having stopped that I'll just kind of accept that my watch is or that my watch is running slow or whatever i'm just going to accept it i don't have to there's no kind of really high level reflection that we're going to need to do but in the kinds of cases that we'll end up talking about where there's this kind of where we're, we're interested in assessing say a naturalistic theory and a theistic theory um we're going to have to think a lot about the kind of the method and the what's the best way to go about determining what's the best view right but but you but in 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 kind of everyday life you you're kind of not in that position because basically you're going to you're going to make a kind of minimal revision to what you've already got right some fairly minimal revision but one that takes you out of the difficulties that you're in um it would be kind of absurd to think oh i've got to sit down and elaborate everything that i believe and then think about all the alternative systems of belief i might have and then try to work out which one of those is the best that's not how you resolve right. you know some some minor um problem that's arisen because there's there's some sort of conflict amongst the beliefs that you've got um so the kind of the kind of project that that i'm talk about in books like the the best argument against god is a kind of you know in some i mean it's an idealized project but it's quite different from the kind of everyday project it's just that sim the the question about how to think about arguments arises in the same kind of way partly because so much of philosophy of religion is traded in arguments for and against the existence of god yeah so when i think about it sometimes we do and maybe we should although that's potentially controversial revise our theories in this way although that's like an idealization but sometimes it seems that what we do is just think okay this is a i've been presented with this argument that has uh, i accept all the premises um and the conclusion is something which I find extremely implausible and so i'll just reject uh, one of the premises whatever one i find least plausible and that sort of procedure I take it needn't always uh, lead us to the view which is theoretically most virtuous in some other sense. So, right. you understand but what you I'm might, getting at here? Yeah, but then you might worry about the fact that you rejected that premise. If you, if there was a better alternative open to you, I mean, if the better alternative was to reject the conclusion then that's what you should have done if the better alternative was to reject one of the other premises then in some sense that's what you should have done of course you might not have i mean we, we've got limited capacities and so this this speaks to the what you do versus what you should do um in some sense it depends how important the issue is whether you're going to invest lots of resources in trying to find a kind of maximal resolution of the problem or whether you're just going to find one that's good enough for your sort of current purposes and on you go. Right. Um, yeah. I wonder though, so do we all have this normative requirement? Is it something that we're all in fact committed to or what if someone rich just rejects it and thinks that, no, the way I'm going to reason is I'm going to take my current credences that I have, um, reject the one that I, you know, the premise or conclusion in which I have the 
the lowest credence and and try to work it out from there um so so well that's not necessarily going to be really very different from what i'm recommending it depends upon what you think about uh, bayesian updating and how realistic you think that is versus the kind of versus the sort of non-numerical but very similar idea that I've got, which is that you um, that you make whatever adjustments will lead you to the most virtuous outcome. The Bayesian reasoning just builds in um, certain stuff that I think's implausible, but uh, it, it's a highly idealized thing. But my description is equally highly idealized. The Bayesian account gives you numbers. So you have prior probabilities for kind of everything. You have um, you have probabilities. I mean, well, you have likelihoods, but there's sort of one kind of conditional probability. When new evidence comes in, there's just a kind of handle that you turn and it spits out the posterior probabilities. And if you thought that that was the correct story, then you're never not going to need to worry about arguments, right? Because part of the story is that you're consistent and you stay consistent if you're an ideal reasoner. And all you ever have to do is update on evidence as it comes in. Uh, that idealization, I think, is not very helpful because apart from anything else, um, we get into cons inconsistency a lot. We find ourselves in these kind of inconsistent um, doxastic situations all the time. And the Bayesian story doesn't tell you anything about how to resolve inconsistencies. Right? So if, if we're in a situation where we're thinking that these kinds of arguments could be useful because people do get inconsistent and don't realize it and it can be pointed out to them, we're not really in a framework where the Bayesian way of thinking about it is going to be helpful. Yeah, that, that's a good point. I mean, it does seem that um, but you would certainly agree that there's some room for Bayesian style reasoning, even if it doesn't isn't applicable in all cases. Right? We want something else to, to resolve disputes and so forth. So, right? so I've actually published stuff coming out in favor of Bayesian statistics. Um, so Bayesian reasoning in a wide range of circumstances. I just think that uh, it's not a kind of universal thing. And in particular, the kind of picture of the ideal Bayesian agent is really not a useful way to think about people. We don't, because there are ways in which we are not Bayesian agents that kind of undermine the kind of universal applicability of the Bayesian picture, for, and in particular, this point that we get inconsistent a lot. Uh, the Bayesian's, Bayesian story just has nothing to tell you about that because it just supposes that you stay inconsistent, that you, that you start off consistent and that the only thing you ever do is update um, as evidence comes in. But the, that's just so idealized that it's not useful as a model. In, there's, maybe I should be a bit more careful. There are very few contexts in which that's going to be useful as a model of humans and human reasoning. And in particular, it's not useful in contexts where we're thinking about, okay, so what can arguments in the sense that we've been talking about, these sort of formal structures, what can they do for us? Right, so this, this uh, seems like we've sort of gotten to answer humble quest question from the chat, although um, I had another question actually related to, to on Bayesianism uh, or Bayesian reasoning. And because a couple months ago we had as a guest, Arif Ahmed, and one thing he commented on um, is that, this was a discussion over miracles, is that <laughs> in certain disputes, the you know priors that the parties bring to the table are gonna be so far apart that there will just be no way to resolve the dispute and we should just move on talk about something else, I guess. Uh, I mean, do you think this is right or a reasonable way to think about uh, some disputes or so, so is there another way? I think that even if people uh, have very kind of, have views that are very distant from one another, so long as you can agree on kind of minimal features of the kind of method for 
assessing the virtues of the two positions, there might be some cases where you can make progress. I mean, you won't be able to make progress in all cases. So maybe this is a good point to um, talk about how I think um, worldviews should be assessed. So suppose you've got two people with different worldviews, and they're quite different. Um, so, I mean, in the, the case that I'm most interested in, suppose one of them's a kind of naturalistic worldview and the other one's a theistic worldview. It may be that in that kind of in general, they, I, I think there's just kind of no algorithm for deciding between the two, which one's the better view. But in particular cases, there might be. And that's because I think that what we're most interested in when we're thinking about the virtues of theories quite generally is how they manage the trade-off between minimising their commitments and maximising explanation. Right? So um, a view that has no commitments can't explain anything. A view that has a kind of ad hoc explanation for everything has an enormous number of commitments. So those are two kind of poles, really, views that are not very good. Somewhere in the middle, there'll be the kind of best views, the, the views that do best on both fronts together. So minimising their commitments, maximising what they explain. Um, we, in some cases, if we've got two worldviews, we may be able to see, just be able to show that one of them is better than the other, because it might be, for example, that one worldview is clearly committed to less, and on the other hand, explains everything the other worldview can explain. Right? And that would be a kind of special case where you would actually get an answer. So thinking about things in this way, in, in the way that I like to think about it, doesn't entail that we're just always going to get this answer that we can't decide which is the better worldview. There will definitely be cases where you can. And we could generalise this point a little bit further. If you think that there are more theoretical virtues, um, that they don't all get subsumed under either minimising your commitments or maximising explanation, we could we could just imagine there are some others, right? It doesn't matter what they are. It will still be the case that it's possible in some cases that one worldview will win on some of them and break even on all the others. And then you get an answer about which is the best worldview, even though there may be lots of other cases where you've got worldviews and some do better on one, some do better on the other, and there's really no way of reaching a verdict uh, about which one's better. Yeah, and, and right, and, and what about the case where um, we're in a disagreement and our interlocutor um doesn't necessarily just think there are more uh theoretical virtues but disagrees with the sort of virtues we have in the first place in other words when we say ah my theory is better to your than yours because it um you know explains more or it has fewer theoretical commitments um and they just say no i don't i don't think those i mean i might agree that they have those features but disagree that my argument my theory is worth worse uh, because it, it it has more commitments and so forth what so, if they don't share yeah so i guess there's some things you could try to say to justify the things that i just said uh, and i'll come to that in a second there's no guarantee that conversations are going to end with a kind of satisfactory resolution so um it might be that people had would have good reasons for saying that that even though in some sense they've got the worst theory, it's fine to stick to it, but they might not. And it might be either that what happens is you kind of decide that there's no point continuing the conversation because they're just being unreasonable or whatever, right? So uh, it's not like um, there can be any kind of magic that's going to ensure that when people disagree that they're going to reach a resolution of their disagreement. Um, there's nothing that ensures that people will behave rationally. So, okay, so let's back up a little bit. If someone says uh, it's perfectly fine to um, have commitments to things that don't explain anything, 
right? They're just extra. So, you know, my, my view's got all these kind of idle wheels in it and yours doesn't. Um, and I agree that you can explain everything that I can explain. I'm going to ask, so why do you believe in these idle wheels? Why do you postulate them? You've got no reason to. It's like believing that they're in shy intuitive fairies at the bottom of your garden, right? Um, just supposing that you do. You think they're shy, so you'll never detect them. You th sorry. <laughs> so so, that you, so they, you think they don't want to be seen. They're intuitive, so you know that you won't see them if you look for them. Uh, you don't have any evidence that there are such things, but you insist on including them in your theory. That just looks bizarre to me. You could do without them, and it wouldn't make any difference to um, your ability to explain anything that needs explaining. Right. And I think a lot of people will have the intuition that it really would be somehow a mistake to believe that there are shy intuitive fairies at the bottom of your garden, right? And that the reason is because there's no reason to believe in them. Right? So I think that there's something to say to people if they were just to, to come back and say, yeah, I agree. My theory's got this stuff in it that there's no reason to believe in it, but I believe in it anyway. That just sounds not quite right to me. Yeah, that, that actually makes a lot of sense to me. Um, we can sort of try to pump their intuition that look, this, this a theory that satisfies these criteria or satisfies them better is going to be more useful. Maybe that's what we're looking for in a theory, and in that sense, is like a preferable theory or a good theory. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, yeah, I mean, they may just not accept it, and you know, you, you're not saying that there is going, always going to be some way to resolve that sort of dispute. No, and but they they're not in, they're not accepting it. Could be just that there's something wrong with the way that they're thinking about these issues. I mean, there's always that kind of option. That would that's a, I think of that as an option of last resort. But I think that were I in the situation of arguing with somebody who insisted that yeah, they had no reason to believe it, but they still thought that there were shy intuitive fairies at the bottom of their garden. I'd be really thinking, I'm not sure I want to continue this conversation any further because it just doesn't look like it's going to go anywhere useful. And what if what if they said, I mean, yeah, what if they said that, okay, I do have some reason to believe it, um, but what I take to be reasons to believe it are not the sort of things, considerations that you would take as reasons to believe things, i.e., is different, yeah. quote unquote, theoretical right. virtues or something else. So, 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 the, okay. Well, then we'd have to have a conversation about that. So, here's something else that might happen. I'm thinking that at the beginning of our discussion, we're going to say what our th theories are, and we, in principle, we're thinking them as theories of everything. So, we're just saying these are all of the things we think are true. Um, and it, I, I'm going to take it that. Uh, what we should think of as data is just everything that we agree on. So that's the stuff that has to be explained. If there's stuff you're committed to that I think is false and you've got an explanation for it, that doesn't count towards the virtue of your theory from the point of view of our dispute. So what to, so so when you said what if they you know what what if they start giving you reasons uh, the the things that will count as reasons is pointing to things that you both agree are true. It won't do for them to point to stuff that only they think is true, right? because that's not that that's that stuff is just part of their theory, right? the the kind of theoretical part of their theory, the part that's in dispute. Right, I, but this is really interesting because it, it almost makes it seem that the reason someone has uh, for some belief, um, whether something is in fact a reason depends on, uh, I guess, certain features of the context or people who, who they're talking to, right? Because um, if I'm talking to someone else who does share this commitment that I'm using as a sort of support for some belief, then it counts as um, a reason for that belief. But if in some other context in which I'm uh, discussing with someone who doesn't share that commitment, 
um, it doesn't so count. I mean, is this is this so, something you would say that? Yeah. So I guess I'm not thinking that, but um, the 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 original um, the 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 question about uh, okay about about what counts as data, right? Might seem that it's going to uh, stack the deck in favour of kind of quite bizarre views because the only stuff that I was thinking that is going to fit into data is the stuff that's agreed. If there are two of us, um, there might be a lot of stuff. If you think about all the different worldviews that, that are out there, you might think that it's going to turn out that there's not much that counts as data and it's going to make it, uh, it it's this is going to kind of give a leg up to all kinds of crazy views. I don't think it will work like that. So um, it, it might, so I mean, to, to make this a bit more concrete, imagine that you've got um, a dispute between a naturalist and say a young earth creationist. And so talking to other people, you'd be able to take things as, to take it as data that the universe is about 13.8 billion years old. But when you're talking to a young Earth creationist, they don't believe that. And so it's not going to be part of the data. However, what will be part of the data for sure is that there's a almost universal consensus amongst practicing expert cosmologists that the universe is about 13.8 billion years old. Right? That's not something that can be denied. And that's something that requires an explanation. And there's a kind of obvious explanation on the one side, namely that the universe is that old and we figured it out, versus some kind of rather complicated story on the other side that's going to have all kinds of curious commitments in it because you've got to explain how this mistaken scientific consensus amongst the experts came about and so on. And so it will turn out that there's a kind of huge liability on the side of the young earth creationists when it comes to explaining the data about that kind of expert consensus. So it really, the kind of concession about what you take as data um, really isn't going to matter that much. And if you came up against someone who started denying things that are sort of obviously true, like that there's this expert consensus on the age of the universe. At that point, um, probably there ceases to be much point in pursuing the conversation with them. Uh, right. But I mean, if you did try to, um, that sort of thing wouldn't be included as data because it's in dispute, right? So, the, the yeah, th yeah, that, that's right. But at a certain, but at a certain point, there are going to be kind of decisions. So, so if we, well, I'm trying to say two things at once. And if you think about the kinds of conversations that we have in philosophy of religion, uh, in the kind of professional philosophy of religion, this kind of stuff that um, the arguments that are prosecuted in journals like the International Journal for Philosophy of Religion and so on, the views that are being discussed are not ones that have those kind of really out there, I mean, denials of things that um, that reasonable people will accept. For example, denying that there is a consensus amongst cosmologists that the universe is about 13.8 billion years old. There isn't anybody in the conversation who denies that. So we're working with this kind of set of worldviews from which um, a whole lot of worldviews have already been excluded. On the other hand, so because I wasn't entirely sure what you what you were asking me, if you're if you're taking seriously a conversation with um, a young Earth creationist, then yes, the the claim that the Earth is thirteen point eight billion years old would not be data, but the claim that there's a consensus among cosmologists that that's what it is that would be data, and that would be something that would have you would have to look at the comparative explanations of. Right. Yeah, that, that, absolutely. I, I guess the concern I have is what about the connection between uh, sort of the stuff you're saying here and more general epistemological issues. So 
Right. So if we say that whether someone has in some sort of disagreement, say, um, uh, you know, reason to believe P depends on whether what the data is and what the data is depends on what's sort of an agreement in the discussion. Um, does that mean that whether the person is justified in believing P is dependent on the context in which they're, you know, just debating or, or right? Do, do, do you kind of understand the concern? Like, can we separate these sort of dialectical contexts and we can ask about what a person has reason to believe in some, in some context like that from the more general or separate epistemological context of, you know, what does the person have reason for like simplicity? You kind of understand what I'm asking? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I agree that there are two kind of different questions here because one question is a question about worldview and it's fairly idealized because it's asking sort of what's the best, what's the best worldview? That's the, that's the kind of area where most of my um, recent work has been focused. If we forget about that stuff and we just focus on a kind of a, an, an ordinary person and their believing and we think about how people um, come to their beliefs and what we want to say about what's rational for them to believe. Well, rational is a as, as some people would say, a polyvalent word, right? There's lots of different things that you might mean by rational. There's lots of different standards uh, that you might ask a rational person to meet. Um, and it, I mean, one way of thinking about this, though it's not the only way, but um, is to ask about what an ordinary, what you know, what kind of standards do you expect an ordinary person to meet? in their everyday updating of their beliefs. And if you think about that in the light of kind of recent psychological work, um, so I'm thinking about the kind of Kahneman and Tversky stuff, and I'm thinking about the dispute between Kahneman and Tversky on one side and Gigerenza on the other, uh, you might think uh, that the fact that, for example, we're often prone to ignoring base rates in doing ordinary statistical reasoning shows either that um, we're kind of irrational a lot of the time, sort of the Kahneman and Tversky view, or that actually doing that is just part of kind of the kind of ordinary rational going about of people, which is kind of roughly the Gugurenza view. Right. So the Gigerenza view, you might think, fits, sits, sets quite a low standard for rationality. And then the Kahneman and Tversky view perhaps sets a slightly higher standard for rationality. Um, the kind of discussion that I've been having is not really a question about rationality at all. But if you want to think of it as setting a standard of rationality, it's almost up there with the Bayesian um, standard, right? right? Yeah, fair enough. I, I, I'll move on to another question I had. And um, I mean, you've, we've talked already about, um, you know, your view about how theories Theories are in some way prior to arguments, it's something you've talked about before at least. And um, when, however, when we have these like principles of theory comparison, you know, preferring, preferring that we should prefer theories that are simpler or um, are more explanatory and so forth, um, we, we can always, at least it seems to me, frame the inference that one theory is better than the other as, as an argument, right? And, you know, we can present that to our interlocutor and they'll accept it insofar as they accept the the principles of theory comparison as well as the you know that other premises in the argument um do you think this is right or is this or is it presenting it as an argument missing something or getting it wrong in some way? okay so i think maybe i should say something about what i meant when i said that theories prior 
to argument. So suppose that you've got a theory in the kind of technical sense. So a theory is just a set of claims closed under logical consequence. And let's suppose that we've got an axiomatization of the theory and you've got a few hundred independent because they're logically independent, because that's what's required, axioms. So that's, that's your theory. Uh, it will be the case, given that you accept the theory, that there's kind of an infinite number of arguments that are sound by your lights. And given that we've got 300 independent axioms, there'll be enormously complicated arguments in that set, probably arguments that are so complicated that no person will ever be able to survey them and certainly no person will be able to, to make a determination about whether um, the conclusion of the arguments or logical consequence of the premises. Now, once you've noted that fact, um, you can see that the kind of question about the soundness of all of those arguments for you is just settled by your having the theory that you do. Right? If you to get to go back to where where we began. Uh, if you've got an argument, a set of premises and a conclusion, and you want to know whether it's sound, there's two things you have to determine. First of all, is the conclusion a logical consequence of the premises? And second, are the premises true? Right. So where does the information for the second part of it come from? It comes from your theory, your view about what's true. Right? And, so, and so that's the point about um, theory being prior to argument. There's an important sense in which the, you're having the views you, that you do about what things are true settles what arguments you should be saying are sound. Now, this says nothing yet about the value of constructing arguments. So you might think that you could give people information by constructing arguments that you think is sound, right? So suppose that I think that an argument with a bunch of premises P1 through Pn and a conclusion Q is sound. When I give you the argument, I'm telling you two things. First of all, that I think all the premises are true. And second, that I think that this further thing follows from the premises. Now, it depends what information I want to convey to you right here. If I all I wanted to tell you was that the premises were true, I didn't need the argument, right? If I want to convey that information to you, I don't need to give you. Now, why would I tell you the other thing? Why am I going to be giving you the other bit of information, the information that I think that this thing follows from those other things? Um, I guess it's perhaps uh, because I think you haven't seen that, right? But if that's what's going on, I uh, that's not going to be interesting to you. Or there's no obvious reason why it's going to be interesting to you unless you accept the premises. Right. Um, and one thing, so there's one other additional thing I could have said here, um, which also has, which also bears on the, the question about the usefulness of framing arguments and transacting them which is that at least in classical logic, the argument from premises, the PI to the conclusion Q, 
is going to be valid. Q is going to be a logical consequence of the PI, just in case the set of sentences that includes the PI and the negation of Q is inconsistent. So uh, there's a different thing that you might think of yourself as doing with arguments. You might think, really, whenever I set out an argument with a bunch of premises and a conclusion, I could equally well have just said, look, this set of sentences is inconsistent. And this point's kind of recognised in the philosophy of religion, literature, um, when people talk about the more shift argument, uh, that one person's modus ponens is another person's modus tollens, right? The, I mean, th th those are just different ways of making this same point. When I give you one of these arguments, what point is there in doing more than just saying this set of sentences are inconsistent when I give the argument to you? Why formulate it the other way with there are these premises and this conclusion? Yeah, so your, your comment here actually sort of preempts a question that I was going to ask, because like, it does seem to me that there are various um, goals that we might have uh, that are satisfied by presenting arguments that aren't just about, you know, getting our interlocutor to recognize some consequence of their views or something like that. It might be to, uh, you know, as you say, communicate some of the beliefs that we have, but also maybe just uh, communicate the sort of inferences that we've made um, and coming to other beliefs that we've we've reached. Um, so that that might be a way, a reason to put it in the form of an argument. Like I, I kind of started with these beliefs. As we're communicating to this this to someone else. I started with these beliefs, and oh look, they actually have this other entailment, um, and that's how I came to that conclusion. And we might that might seem to be something that that happens sometimes reasonably. I, I mean, what do you think about that as a sort of utility of presenting arguments? So, um, I guess I think you could do that, but I don't, I, I don't see it happening very often. I mean, I do think that the, here's a set of sentences, these sentences are inconsistent, uh, can be kind of independently interesting. So, I mean, an example that I sometimes talk about if you look in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy and you look at the entry on the problem of the many written by Brian Weatherson, he says, look, he starts the article by saying, look, here's this set of claims that are jointly inconsistent. You can't accept them all. And then in the literature on the problem of the many, we see that there's a bunch of people that reject. For each of these claims, there's a bunch of people who reject it. And they're doing that counts as a solution to the problem of the many. Right, so you can think of the, of the demonstration that a set of sentences is inconsistent as a way of structuring a kind of philosophical survey of discussion in a particular domain. Right, and that, that, for example, seems perfectly fine for, to me, just as, to go back to an example that we talked about earlier, it's obviously fine for mathematicians to be kind of deriving stuff and saying, from these premises, you get this conclusion. What's not clear to me amongst the things you said is that we should think of, if I want to convey some claims to you that I hold, why I wouldn't just say, these are the things I believe. Why would I package it up in an argument? That just seems, <laughs> that just seems completely unnecessary. Right, it's a more complicated way of giving you information that that will be quite puzzling to you. Because why are you giving it to me as an argument if really all you wanted to do was tell me that I that you accept these premises? Why didn't you just say so? It seems to violate mm -hmm. the kind of Gricean maximum maxim to you know <laughs> say no more than you have to in order to get across the information that you want to convey. Right, so so I find. That suggestion not very promising. I, I see your point, although the, I think the idea was that in some cases we're not just trying to convey the sort of list of beliefs that we have, but we're also trying to convey the sort of, um, you know, 
reasoning we went through to get to some of the beliefs that we have, right? So I might have started with some simpler theory, um, and I might want to try to uh, convey some, you know, belief that I came to by realizing that it's a consequence of that theory, um, or a consequence of the axioms of that theory, because I guess it's already part of the theory since they're close and they tell me. Um, and I don't know, I might find some use in presenting it that way rather than just listing out the, the different commitments that I have. Does that kind of make sense? So maybe there's another thing that's going on here, uh, which is that uh, at least some people think that there are more kinds of arguments than those in which the conclusions are logical consequence of premises. Uh, and you might think, for example, that if, you know, if you think there are kind of arguments by inference to the best explanation, you might think that you want to tell somebody that the way that you arrived at your belief that such and such was because it was an inference to the best explanation from this other stuff. And so you'll get people, so, so you might think, so here's my here's my argument. It's not it's not it's not an argument in which the conclusion is a logical consequence of the premises. But this argument encapsulates or explains to you why I accept the conclusion. I accept the conclusion because I think that it's an inference to the best explanation from um, these premises. Is that the sort of thing that you've got in mind? Yeah, I mean, I mean, but it needn't just be. Um... Uh, like the sort of amplitude of arguments, it could it could also be the sort of deductive arguments. I mean, I might I might really just want to convey to you the sort of deductions that I went through um, for some reason or another to, to so, reach the conclusion that I did. So 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 I mean, one one way of thinking, uh, one kind of example of that will be if it's mathematics, right? <laughs> right. Here's my proof that there's infinitely many prime numbers. And so then I give you, right, whatever I, whatever I started from, and um, perhaps in this case, there were no premises, right? It's just a reductio argument, but, you know, suppose this for, this, this for the sake of reductio, and here we get out the conclusion. Uh, of course, that's fine. If that's fine in, in mathematics, and it could be fine in some other context too. It could be an explanation of how you got to um, a, a certain belief, right? I'm committed to these other things. This thing follows from it. So, of course, I'm committed to it too, right? That seems fine. I don't see that any of that was um, inconsistent with the things that I was saying before. Right? Because yeah. in, in that case, you're not giving me the argument to persuade me of the conclusion. You're right. giving me the argument because you're saying, look, um, I, I arrived at this conclusion by inferring it from this other stuff that I believe. That seems perfectly fine. All right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and so insofar as we're given the argument to persuade someone, uh, it seems that the sort of reasonable goal is there to to get them to recognize some consequence they previously hadn't recognized or um, of their view. Um, of course, someone might try to persuade someone uh, with an argument uh, by sort of, maybe we might consider this dishonest, but some sort of like rhetorical trick or um, something else. I mean, these are other goals. These are just other goals that people might have in mind and are ways that someone might present an argument to convince somebody. but. Um, I guess um, it's not the sort of, yeah, not the thing you have in mind when you're talking about convincing someone. I mean, you should be aware of this, though. So, um, I don't know, I can't remember the exact details of who this was, but there was a, an exchange between a, a theist who was a mathematician and a, a, an atheist. I think this happened in France a couple hundred years ago. And the mathematician wrote a bunch of equations down and then wrote, therefore God exists. And the atheist who had no knowledge of mathematics at that point just said, I have to retire. I can't assess the argument, right? Now you can imagine 
using that trick in a kind of public forum, just writing up this stuff that nobody understands and then writing your, therefore, and then writing down whatever conclusion you want to draw and actually persuading people who, that them that your conclusion must be true on the strength of things like your credentials in mathematics or something like that, right? And I, I agree that there's something. I mean, it was. It, I, I think in that in the particular case, the historical case, it really was dishonest. Right? I mean, the 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 person, the mathematician, didn't believe that the conclusion followed from the premises. It was just a rhetorical trick. Right. That sort of stuff happens. Uh, you should be on guard against it. Um, part of kind of learning um, critical thinking in a university is to tell you about rhetorical tricks like that. But as you suppose, that's fairly remote from the discussion that we've been having. I and mean, I'm assuming that uh, either that stuff like that's not going on, or that the participants are kind of cluey enough that they're going to realise that stuff like that is going on. Is it? Yeah, interesting. Is the example you're thinking about this, um, the unnoticeable from the chat is commenting, is this uh, from an Euler uh, Diderot encounter? Diderot? Yeah, it could be. I'm not sure. I, j I don't remember. It's just a kind of, it, it's a, story I got told when I was an undergraduate, and I just can't remember the details. I just remember the kind of the shape of the story. So. Yeah, fair enough. I think I think that was it, but that's uh, interesting to think about. Um, so I, I wanted to move on to some questions about sort of explanation. And a few months ago, we, we had as a guest, Peter Van Inwagen, and one thing that he commented on was that he's very critical of the view that it's the uh, sort of business of philosophers to explain things, or that we we shouldn't really be comparing philosophical theories based on how well they explain things because they do no such thing. <laughs> um, uh, does this make sense to you? And, and, and more directly, I suppose, um, do you have a general notion of explanation on which you know theories, as well as philosophers, do explain things? So I think, I do think that philosophers make theories and I think that it's the business of theories to explain. Right? So I guess that I disagree with Van Inwagen. Uh, you could think uh, about it this way. Um, in your theory of everything, there's there's going to be lots of stuff in there that's just common sense and science. And then there's going to be some other stuff that's in there. Uh, and that other stuff we might think of as being kind of broadly philosophical. And then the, when, when we're doing the comparison between two different worldviews, and we're taking the stuff that's agreed on as data, it's kind of un unproblematic, um, I think, to suppose that the theoretical part of the theory um, is going to explain some or all of the stuff that we're thinking of as the data for the theory. Now, maybe there's something with thinking about things in that way, but straight off, I can't see what it would be. So, right. So, so what is it that um, are sort of the minimal requirements? If, I mean, do you think there are any for something to to count as an explanation for something else? Um, does it have to so entail there, so there, something, or yeah? Uh, no, I'm not thinking that it's going to be. Uh, logical consequence. So there's there's a in the kind of hyper idealized way of thinking about stuff. Uh, I'm going to say that uh, when we're thinking about the simplicity of theories, one thing that we think about is the simplicity of the axiomatization 
of the theory. If one theory has got a simpler axiomatization than another, that's a reason for preferring the theory with the simpler axiomatization, all else being equal. And I'm going to say that logical consequence, what you get is a logical consequence of stuff that you're committed to. Essentially, you get for free. So when we're thinking about what the commitments of your theory are, right, we only have to look at the axiomatization and what what's involved in it, right? So what things and kinds of things does it commit you to? What um, primitive terms, primitive undefined terms do you need in order to express, express the theory? Um, and then there's the kind of the complexity of the axiomatization as well. Right. Um... So I'm so sorry. That wasn't, that wasn't a, yeah. yeah, that wasn't a complete answer to the question, but um, while I was concentrating on that, I've forgotten what the question was that I was answering. So, no, no, no worries. I guess the the, the question was: um, are, are there, on your view, sort of clear criteria for um, so what counts as an explanation? You mentioned that doesn't have to be necessary. Right. Right. So, 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 yeah. So. So that that point was a point about logical consequence. There are different kinds of explanations, I think, um, and I I don't think that explanatory relations are going to be necessarily relations of logical consequence. So it might be, for example, that um, that in some cases of causal explanation, there's logical consequence lurking in the background. Perhaps there is in the case of deterministic causes. So um, perhaps the way to think about this is that kind of given prior conditions and the laws, you get an entailment given that we've got deterministic causation. But suppose that we've got indeterministic causation. There's an explanatory relation here between the thing, you know, so if A indeterministically causes B, that's an explanation of why you get B. It's not an explanation of why you get B rather than the other things that indeterministically might have arisen from the cause A, but it's certainly an explanation of why you got B rather than all of the various things that couldn't have arisen given that you already had A and there's some sort of this chance distribution over the things that A could give rise to. So there are going to be explanations that are not logical consequence. That's for sure. But there are also different kinds of explanations. Causal explanations are not the only kind of explanation. There are, there are for example, structural explanations as well. Um, there are, in some sense, mathematical explanations and so on, right? There's a great diversity of kinds of explanation, at least according to me. It's part of the idea there with uh, with indeterministic explanation that um, you, to count as explanation has to be somewhat contrastive, but it has to rule out some alternatives, but yeah. it doesn't necessarily have to rule out, rule out all alternatives. Yeah, but, that's right. Whereas in deterministic explanation, you rule out all but one. Right. Uh, of, of the alternatives. Uh, and that still seems, it seems to me that appeal to indeterministic causation is still explanation. Yeah. I told you, I've told you why we got B, uh, but I haven't told you why we got B rather than some of the other alternatives. We got B because there was this indeterministic process and we already had A. That's why we got B. That's all I can tell you about why we got B. Um, I can't tell you why we got B rather than C, given that C was in another of the things that A could have given rise to. So this idea here, I wonder what you think of the views of explanation. I'm gonna to get to a similar question from the unnoticeable. Um, views of explanation that are sort of like uh, pragmatist, um, like, sort of like a description that's sort of useful to us. Um, well, that's, we can count that as explanation in some sense. I know we've recently talked about idle wheels. That made me think of Philip Kitcher, who I think has moved more towards a pragmatist view of these sorts of things. 
Um, do you think a sort of pragmatist approach on some of these matters is, is, is helpful or, or does that... Uh, uh, so, okay, so I'm, I guess it, it depends on the kind of examples that we're thinking about. Uh, if you think about um, Van Frassen's example of the flagpole and the shadow, um, what explains what? Whether whether the the height of the flagpole explains the length of the shadow, or the length of the shadow explains the height of the flagpole, might well depend upon kind of contextual factors about um, what we're interested in. I mean, if the flagpole was designed so that at a certain point of the day the shadow would reach a certain point on the ground, then if if that's true, then there's going to be a sense in which the height of the flagpole is explained by the length of the shadow. Right. I mean, that was the that's kind of the gist of the um, the Van Frassen example, which right. makes it look as though. Uh, in kind of everyday context, what explains what depends upon sort of contextual features of the circumstances and so on. And I'm suspecting that that's kind of what you mean by right, the, yeah, exactly. Prag, 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 pragmatist approach. Yeah, uh, what explains what depends on our sort of interests that we have. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that seems fine, but in that particular case, uh, from the standpoint of kind of theory of everything, there's going to be two different kinds of true explanations to be given. <laughs> it's true in one sense that the height of the flagpole explains the length of the shadow, sort of physical explanation in terms of you know, where the sun is in the sky, et cetera, et cetera. And then there'll be another part of the theory which will give you the other explanation, which is also true, that the um, the the height of the flagpole is as it is because it was determined that the flagpole would be here and it was desired that at a certain point in the day, at a certain time of the year, the shadow should just reach this point on the ground. And there's no inconsistency or tension between those two um, explanations. And I... Uh, it's just that our interests might determine that we're interested in one of them rather than in the other one in particular circumstances. But if we're thinking about a total theory of everything, both of them are going to be in there. So I'm not sure that I, 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 I don't see that there's any conflict that's going to arise out of this. And the, the, the project of thinking about theories of everything or constructing theories of everything is a kind of abstruse theoretical it's not part of everyday practice our everyday practice i mean obviously it's going to be the case that what we take to explain what what is going to be determined by our interests i think i think that's a kind of obviously true point yeah so i think it seems like the right takeaway that like if the pragmatist is just commenting on you know what what sort of explanations we might be interested in or focus on that that's fine uh, unless so long as they're not saying that, look, the ones that we're interested in are in are therefore the only ones that are genuine explanations and the other ones aren't. That that seems to be going too far. So that's, I take that to be what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, that seems um, that seems fair enough. And you, you brought up Van Frossen, so that uh, transitions nicely to unnoticeable question. So he says, some have criticized the whole project of metaphysics on the basis of Sort of constructive empiricism from Van Frossen. Uh, they argue that explaining by postulating aspects of the world beyond experience is often problematic because metaphysics as a whole employs inference to the best explanation, um, you know, criteria including agreement with intuition, agreement with common sense, simplicity, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, which does not have a clear connection to truth. So while scientific theories do employ this method, they also have predictive power which significantly distinguishes them from metaphysical theories. In addition, even if the criteria for inference to the best explanation does correlate to truth, um, it might just be the best explanation of a bad lot. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on this, if any? So, okay, 
So there's so many things there. So let's yeah, start no, with the lot, last. Yeah. So let's start with the last point. Suppose it turns out that um, there's a clear winner, that kind of best worldview that we've currently got. Then if you're going to do anything, uh, whatever the attitude's going to be, that's the worldview you're going to run with. Maybe you're not going to. May, maybe although I'm sceptical about this, there's a distinction between belief and acceptance and you're only going to accept it rather than believe it. It seems to me the right thing to do is going to be to believe it. Um, not That doesn't mean necessarily that you're going to go very strongly in favour of it, but more of your credence is going to go there than to the worst views, right? It will be totally weird to give a whole lot of extra credence to some view that you thought was a worse view. So, so that will be on on the on the last point. Uh, on the question, to go back to the beginning, I'm, I know there's something in the middle that I'm missing, but to go back to the to the beginning part of the the comment. Uh, the there constructive empiricism, the way that Van Frassen developed it, relies on there being a kind of line between the observable and the unobservable, uh, so that you know there's a kind of clear answer to the question about um, which, which things. Uh, kind of merely speculative and which things are not. But that line seems to move. It doesn't, it doesn't seem like it's a line that's got any um, really sharp independent justification. So if you go back um, 150 years, it was quite clear that we couldn't see protein molecules. It's not so clear now if you think about the kind of aids that we've got for looking at things that with really high powered microscopes, it's we still want to say that we can't see protein molecules. So I do think that there might be kind of theoretical, there might be a kind of in principle difficulty about um, th that constructive empiricists are going to face about saying that there's this kind of bright line um, that divides the things that it's okay to believe and the things where you really should only accept the theories because they're kind of useful calculating devices, predictive devices. Okay, the next question. So in the middle there, there was a question about prediction. Um, so it's there was something about that, how, yeah, 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 yeah. So, 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 kind of metaphysical theories don't make predictions about um, you know future observations, right? In a way that scientific theories do, and you might think of. And, and I think there was also something in there about the kind of connection between that point and inference to the best explanation as well, that you might think that kind of what drives good inference to the best explanation is that you've got a theory that's making predictions and these predictions um, are being confirmed. And so that kind of gives you grounds for thinking that not not just that um, this is the best theory that we've got, but there's some, kind of some reason for thinking that the theory is true. Right. Um, so I think the point about prediction is fair, but I'm not sure that uh, that that's a sufficient reason for thinking that we shouldn't employ inference to the best explanation more broadly, okay, that it's that somehow either that just rules out using inference to the best explanation in metaphysics. Is it, do you take it to be some reason to think that, um, you know, sort of scientific theories are better as theories than sort of metaphysical theories, the uh, ones that we should assign higher credence to maybe? 
Okay, so um, I think that uh, where you've got well-established scientific theory, where there's kind of agreement amongst the experts that um, in these circumstances, this is the theory that you should use to generate predictions about what's going to happen, that ordinary people should just coordinate their opinion to the expert opinion. It would be reckless for people to do anything else, right? So if we're talking about classical mechanics, this is a domain where the theory is well worked out. The, the physicists all agree that this is the right kind of explanation of phenomena in this domain. You should just co coordinate your opinion to it. There's nothing like that in philosophy. There's certainly nothing like that in metaphysics. So um, it's obviously the case, I think, that well-established science has a very different epistemic standing from philosophy. And that should be enough to, I think that's sufficient to answer the question. Yeah, no, that's, that's really good. Uh, thanks. I, I mean, on that uh, earlier thing relating to um, sort of constructive empiricism and uh, finding, placing that bar between what's reasonable to believe and unreasonable to believe on, you know, uh, dividing what we can, what, observe yeah, with the native senses. Yeah. And so, yeah, yeah, you know, anything not theory related. I mean, that seems to me kind of suspicious. It's almost like a sort of uh, selective skepticism in a way, placing the bar there. Like we can, some of the arguments that you could present against like scientific realism, for example, um, say, especially under determination arguments, work just as well um, uh, on observables. Um, the sort of uh, observations we think we're making could in principle have been caused by any number of things. And so you could undermine it that way as well. <laughs> it's not, so it's not obvious to me that, um, you know, first of all, as you point out that this sort of boundary is well-defined and second, that we're really warranted to putting the boundary there, it just seems, um, Something yeah. that has to be shown. Yeah. 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 So, so I'm fine with that too. Yeah. yeah and, and this sort of very related uh, question from Kayak is, is wondering do you have a, um, a, a very specific view on, on scientific anti realism? Uh, do you agree with it or disagree, or do you think it's, uh, how would you take the thesis? Um. So I guess I'm, I'm, my inclinations are obviously are towards realism. So I think, but I, where, where I'm going to be careful is I'm going to want to draw a line between the stuff where there's kind of universal expert consensus and where there isn't. In where, where there's just consensus, like I think that there really is a consensus that there are electrons. And so I'm quite happy to believe that there are electrons. Uh, are there strings? Uh, who knows, right? The physicists are in no agreement about that. I'm certainly not going to take a stand one way or the other. Not, um, but if, if the matter becomes settled one way or the other, then I'll coordinate my opinion to what the scientists say. And that just seems to me kind of what ordinary people should do. Right. I mean, it seems to be a reasonable advice, though, that um, we'd want to be more hesitant on uh, making claims about the nature of these things. Like, you know, people have long said electrons are uh, what some sort of point particle, or maybe some people think them as of them now with like perturbations in field. I mean, maybe the some future scientific theory will undermine that entirely. So, I mean, I don't. Would you agree that, that? Yeah, I don't think that it'll undermine um, the belief that there are electrons. Right? It's it's just right. that the, the question will be what they are. So there are things like we've measured the charge of an electron, right? And I can't remember some tiny amount of coulombs. I can't remember what it is, right? Um, that bit of information, it seems very unlikely to to be overturned, right? just to put it mildly. Yeah. So, yeah. 
Yeah, I just yeah. wonder how much of that is like, okay, if it, we're just thinking of an electron as, you know, whatever it is that's um, uh, results in these um, observable measurements on our, <clears throat> sorry, on our uh, instruments or whatever. And, um, okay, it seems to me that we can, has this property of charge and that's something else that produces an observable uh, res result. But saying something um, more directly about the unobservable, i.e. this sort of yeah. its internal structure or it's like nature as a perturbation sure. in the field, maybe maybe we're less warranted in, in those sorts of things. Yeah, right. So, and and it gets worse as you go further down, I guess. So um, what you can say about quarks, for example, um, might be even more problematic than what you can say about electrons. But um, I, I mean, there, there are going to be difficulties of, of a whole lot of kinds once we start, if, if we were to try to pursue a discussion about the quantum realm generally, but that would just be way beyond my competence. I'm not a physicist at all. So uh, it's probably, you know, safer not to go there. <laughs> Yeah, fair enough. And and another question from Kayak, who's um, wondering this sort of uh, uh, that whether you think that science and philosophy are sort of progressive or continuous research programs that are um, not really distinct, or, but kind of flow from each other, or uh, that sort of Quinean way that they're sort of yeah. that they're continuous with each other. Do you think that that's true, or? Right, so so I was tempted to say earlier that maybe we should follow Quine, that, that is earlier in the conversation at a certain point, in thinking of um, the kind of philosophy is just rounding out science. But that's that's not really the view I've got. So I mean, to think about, think about the disciplines, the way that I think about other disciplines is that they, they have a core on which there's kind of expert consensus about claims and methods. So there's a body of truths and we've got a body and when there, and there's a bunch of methods that we can use to work out further things. Around that core is the area where current research is going on. There's a bunch of claims whose status is currently contested, but it's being investigated and we're very confident that the methods that we've got will eventually tell us where the truths lie. And then as we kind of move a bit further out, we get into this gray area where there are some claims, but we really got no idea about the tr whether the claims are true or not. And we're also not really sure what methods, uh, if any, will enable us to answer those questions. And then we've just moved into the philosophy of that particular discipline. And I think pretty much every discipline has that kind of structure. And so there's a philosophy of physics and a philosophy of chemistry and a philosophy of religion and so on. And in every case, what that philosophy is about is those questions that look like they're attached to the discipline, but we just have no idea how to get consensus answers on them. We've got no idea what methods are going to enable us to get the consensus answers or to put it a different way that are going to get us to the truth. So it, that's not quite the Quinean picture, but that's much closer to my picture. That's not the whole story about philosophy because there are bits, there are kind of other areas that just seem to be kind of resolutely philosophical. So <clears throat> um, I mean, especially the normative seems to be like this, but not only the normative. That is, there's a bunch of questions and we just don't know how to get consensus answers on them. We don't know what methods are going to enable us to get consensus answers on them. Um, right. So uh, it's not that every bit of philosophy sort of sits on the periphery of some other discipline. Yeah, I think that's a, a kind of a pretty helpful way to think about it. It makes a lot of sense. Um, another question related to explanation um, before I forget. Um, so you've this is from the unnoticeable he, he says he re recently watched a video where our robert coons describes your version of the psr or of a psr as a thesis that 
all non-initial things have causes. Um, is that a sort of is that something that you commit to? First, get that right. So, um, if we think of there being and that that what we're talking about is a reality that's a network of causes, then yes, I think that everything in the network has an explanation, a causal explanation, except for the initial things. It's not that I think that the initial things are unexplained, it's just they have a different kind of explanation. That's assuming that there is a set of initial things. There's a different debate to have about that. But on the assumption that there are initial things, I think the best thing to think about them is that they're necessary and their necessity explains them. And so then uh, you get a PSR, everything, everything has an explanation. So you would uh, assent to that that version of the PSR that all things have all facts have explanation? Um so no, because I think that there's no explaining the necessary facts. So right, I mean right. It's, so I think that's where explanation is going to run out. Of course, other people will disagree and think that there are kind of initial things that are just kind of brute contingent facts and explanation runs out there. And I think I kind of not really sure what to make of the issue. Like if, there's, if that's what you're going to disagree about, whether you say that the initial things are necessary or you say they're contingent, what the stakes are, what reasons there would be for favouring one answer rather than the other, maybe it will come down to sort of questions about how you think about modality more generally, how right. you want to talk about possible worlds, how you think about um, the the scope of possible worlds. I kind of like a kind of actualist view where, you know, sort of what's actual determines what's possible. So um, all the possibilities are possibilities for the actual world. So you get the, I mean, Storrs McCall was one person who had a kind of view like this where you think of um, the, all possible worlds share some history with the actual world and they diverge from it because chances play out differently. That was basically his view. And I think that that's kind of good. That gives you a very kind of narrow conception of what's possible. Not many things are possible. If you prefer the kind of whatever's conceivable is possible approach, you're going to think that there's way more possibilities. I kind of like the idea of, of you having to justify claims about possibilities more strongly than just saying that you can conceive of them. So I, I, I don't think that, the, that having lots and lots of possibilities is just kind of desirable in itself. Right. Uh, just on the, I mean, we might get to modality in a second, but on that idea of um, uh, on the PSR, when we have, because on your view that evolution of the world is at least uh, partly chancy. Um, uh, and we sort of talked about explanation a bit before, but there's going to be some, for any objectively chancy event, it seems to me that it's going to be some, at least some contrastor fact that has no further explanation. I mean, there just has to be. Right, right? sure. And, and so it's going yes, to be brief. That's right. Yeah. So, so um, I was, the, the question that you, that, that I was thinking about was the kind of stuff in the the network. If you think of the, the I mean, now it depends what you think the network right. is connects, whether it's things or events, but let's go with events. There'll be no event that doesn't have an explanation. There will certainly be um, facts that have no explanation because mm. um, I'm, I'm committed to that from the, um, what, what I said about indeterministic causation and the kind of contrasted facts that arise there. But I don't think of causation as a relationship between facts. So um, Right, right. But then that that you would then be just denying the principle that all facts have explanations. Sure. I certainly right. deny that. Yeah. Right. But I deny that twice over because I think that boundary facts, right? So when we were talking about initial facts, let's I'll, I'll just call them boundary facts there. Um, those are going to have no explanation. 
uh, something something somewhere there is going to have no explanation um if you think that they're necessary then their necessity is going to have no explanation if they're contingent and they're initial there's nothing that you can appeal to to explain them and so they're going to have no explanation it's it's going to be the yeah. case that it's going to be the case that there's a bunch of facts that have no explanation and i don't think you can get around that the I know kind of traditionally the way to go is to try to say that some facts explain themselves, but I just resist that idea. I think that the notion of self-explanation is just incoherent. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, although on on whether the there can be sort of initial facts without explanations, like on some views of the way um, the world is, we we tend to. You know, we tend to explain things by sort of the causal history of those things, but that's not necessarily the only way to explain them. I mean, some some people might think of the world as you know, for a bee theory about time, the world is some big block in some way. Yeah. Um, and okay, I can explain certain a part of the block in terms of some other part of the block, but it needn't be some prior part of the block. I mean, maybe I can, if I have a, um, I can explain the sort of initial part in terms of some other part and laws of nature. I mean, what's in principle wrong with that sort of explanation? And in that sense, maybe the boundaries could be explained in some way, right? Yeah, I, I think, I think that's gonna, I don't think that's gonna work, but I, I mean, you would have, it, it, part of the thing is that it now feels as though you're gonna end up with circles of explanation, which will mean that you'll end up with things explaining themselves if you if you accept that there's kind of transitivity. If A explains B and B explains yeah. C, then A. Sorry, if, if A is an explanation of B and B is an explanation of C, then A is an explanation of C, right? And so I'm, I mean, I, I'm familiar with people who've tried to argue that you could um, explain the kind of initial stuff in terms of stuff that comes in some sense later. But I think that that's going to get you into difficulties that you should want to avoid. Yeah, you're going to end up with this sort of web of facts or events, however you want to put it, um, that sort of explain each other in some way. But do you, yeah. I mean, I guess you're left wanting, first of all, if you, if you think that, um, you can't have circular explanation and explanation is transitive, then you can't have this. Um, yeah. But also you might still be wanting for an explanation of the whole thing, the whole um, uh, the whole world, so to speak, instead of just offering explanations for different parts of it in terms of others. Um, and and that other yeah, I, I, and uh, certainly, I mean, you mentioned Rob Coons, and I mean, Alex Proust is another person you might mention in his connection of Josh Rasmussen. There are various people mm -hmm. who, who've asked that question. So consider the sum of contingency, right? What, what kind of explanation can you give of it? And some, some of them are inclined to say, so there's got to be this kind of a necessary thing that explains the sum of contingency. That sounds to me like it can't work because just ask about the connection between what's necessary and what's contingent. And uh, it seems like it can't be contingent because what was being explained was the sum of contingency. So this thing can't be part of that. But it also seems like it can't be necessary because if it was necessary, then what came on the kind of the explanatory side would be necessary too. So it doesn't seem as though the sum of contingency can be explained in terms of what's necessary. Uh, so anyway, can can we get around that by denying the the uh, that explanations have to entail? Like like, what if we just think that yes, something necessary can in some way explain contingent things, um, but it it can explain it without entailing them. Um, so uh, I yeah. I think that's fine, but. What was going on here was that we were talking about kind of the sum of all contingency. That was what put the constraint on it. Uh, so uh. I take it, see, I take it that um, thinking about this, the view that I sort of like, though I'm not 
hugely committed to it. If the initial state's necessary, subsequent stuff can still be contingent because the evolution of the state can be chancy, right? So even though it starts out necessary, so you can go from, there's no problem about going from necessity to contingency. You just have to build in um, something like that. So, if, but, but, but what, you, what you can't do is think about a sum of contingency and then exp ask what explains that sum because the connection was chancy, right? So it's not that, it's not that, um, that the sum of contingency wouldn't include that. But if it does, it's not really, you don't really now have something that what's necessary can explain because we've kind of got things in the wrong ontological categories now. It's not that the, uh. the, the initial thing all on its own explains, it was rather the initial thing and it's um, acting in this chancy way that explained what came later. Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting point. It's like we can, at the same time, we could grant that um, there could be some connection between necessary events and contingent ones, or a necessary event could explain some contingent event or events. But it can't, doesn't really make sense to say that explaining all of them, all contingent uh, events or facts, however you want to put it, because it would also have to explain the, the connection between them and now, how is it doing that? Is that chancy? Well, then there's some other contingent fact. Maybe this is part of the worry. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so that's right. So, so I mean, to go, the the thing you said was right. There's it. There's no problem going from the necessary to the contingent. You just have to think about it in the right way. Yeah, and so to return to the unnoticeable question about Robert Coons. Um, he was asking, he was wondering how you would reply to Kuhn's criticism of your PSR that it would lead to some sort of radical skepticism because you would not be able to determine if your perceptions are are sort of uncaused or initial. Right. So I don't have a short answer to that. I wrote a paper. So um, Kuhn's originally published this very long, complicated argument to that effect. And I replied to it with a very long and complicated reply. Um, he's more recently with Alex Proust kind of done a rerun on the argument. And I think that it's that when the, the answer to the question is you look through the details of the argument and it's clear that it's not true, right? There's nothing, there's nothing, there's no threat of skepticism in my supposing um, that um, the things that I do about the um, beginnings of the universe. And it's not really very plausible to think that somehow or other making that, that uh, um, supposition is going to lead to skepticism, lead to global skepticism. Right. Now, it could be yeah. that the right way to understand what Coons is saying is that he thinks that there's some inconsistency in my view, uh, because clearly I'm not a skeptic, right? I believe in all kinds of stuff, but I can't see what it is amongst the things that I'm committed to that generates a contradiction or an absurdity. Yeah, I mean, I tend to think of those as like two different sorts of um, ways that someone could argue that you're committed to skepticism. One is to say that look, these are some of the commitments you have and they really entail that you don't have any knowledge or something like that in some way. Yeah. Another is to say, well, it's just to present a sort of classic skeptical argument. Right? Oh, here, the skeptical regress and now you, how do you solve that? Well, that if, if that's what they're presenting, then, um, well, first of all, it's nothing in particular about this, uh, this view that's sort of generating that. That's just a general concern, um, if it is. And um, presumably, someone who accepts a PSR would face that just as much, if, if right. either so, did. So, so yeah. that was that was in effect what I did. What I argued against Coons originally was that he was the one who was committing himself to a skeptical principle that I rejected. 
Yeah. So, so, I, mean, so I, I, I avoided skepticism, but he was actually committing himself to the kind of skepticism that I would not commit myself to. Yeah, that's, that seems right to me. I mean, whether we're committed to skepticism depends on sort of uh, various epistemological commitments we have, right? And what's sort of entailed by those. Um, and if you don't have those, then you're not committed to skepticism. And it doesn't seem to me that, um, I mean, it's, it's doubtful that the sort of view you presented here about um, your PSR or, or also in the denial of other forms of PSR, because this comes up there as well, um, entail something, entail some skeptical conclusion that seems, um, that seems uh, at the very least undemonstrated. Uh, that seems to be part of the point you're making up. Yeah, but the, the thing is, it's a very long and complicated argument. If you really kind of want to get into the weeds, you can go and have a look at it for yourself. But I don't think that, I don't think that it works. Yeah, fair enough. Um, so another thing about explanation. Um, yeah, Kayak had an, inter an interesting question relating to whether there are ever cases of circular explanation, especially... The, I mean, we can imagine a case where, I mean, maybe this turns out to not be possible, but I mean, maybe that has to do with the answer. But what if it turned out that there were instances of time travel and um, something you do in the past in some way can be used to explain something you do now and something you do now and can be used to explain your, your traveling back into the past and, and you get a sort of circle of explanation or you could. Um, does that seem uh, horribly problematic or, you know, yeah. So, so, so I guess what I want to say about that is that uh, you can certainly tell a coherent story about time travel and it will involve um, circles of explanation. But it's one thing to tell a coherent story. It's another thing to describe something that's metaphysically possible. Right, on my view, is it consistent with the way the world is set up? Right, given that everything that's every possible, if if it's true, as I think that every possible world, every metaphysically possible world, shares some history with the actual world, are there any possible worlds where there's time travel? I'm inclined to think not. Um, I know it it might still be slightly an open question amongst physicists whether there could be time travel. Um, and so maybe I should be a little bit cautious about committing myself on that. But it seems to me that this is one of those those cases where we've got a, a, you can tell a, you can tell a coherent story, but we should nonetheless think that it's a coherent story about something that's impossible. So is, is part of your uh, reason for thinking that it's metaphysically impossible, like? conceptual or is like because obviously there's these sort of paradoxes of time travel that are so, paradoxes that come up or is it science so 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 i'm thinking my, i'm thinking that given that the way that the world is um there there's not going to be There's there's kind of there's no point in the um, so okay so I'm, think, I'm trying to think about the extent to which it's the paradoxes that are the worry here. Um, I, I'm not sure that it's the paradoxes so much as the lack of mechanism. It just seems that it just seems clear that there's. An, sorry, I shouldn't say it seems clear. I don't see any way that, um, given given physics as I understand it, given the way the world is as I understand it, that um, travel in to the past is viable. And I also think that if you kind of trace back history and then you think about chances playing out differently, you think about other sort of ways that the world might have gone, that it's going to be any different 
on any of those. And that's, although that's kind of, that was kind of very hand wavy, that's why I'm inclined to think that it's impossible. Yeah, well, I mean, it, uh, something uh, maybe less problematic than time travel would be that could still generate the same sort of concern would be backward causation. So if you think that something happening now could cause something in the yeah. past, maybe even the distant past, then you could still maybe generate these generate these sort of circles of uh, explanation. Right. Think about so that. so 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 do we have any reason to think that there is backward? causation I and mean, i'm assuming that if there isn't it's not going to kind of arise in the future right? i mean is is there backward causation well some people have thought to explain um certain quantum phenomena in terms of epr correlations and stuff yeah so there's i mean hugh price is one person amongst others who's been kind of tempted by that kind of view so i and, that, and this is partly why i hesitated uh, because if it turns out that really we kind of converge on the idea that that's the best way to explain the EPR correlations, well, then I'll revise my claim. I, I would just say, okay, so that it turns out I was wrong. Not only is it possible, it's actual. Yeah, fair enough. Um, um. Yeah, uh, I don't think this was a question that Kayak was wondering, but it's something that um, I guess I was interested in some of your more general epistemological views. So, for example, the Munchausen trilemma, do you have a, do you consider yourself a foundationalist, a coherentist, emphasis, or do you think that the trilemma is somehow flawed, or do you have a view on, on general epistemology of that way, in that sense? Um, I'm not sure how it fits into the kind of trilemma. Uh, so, uh, to the extent that I ha have a kind of epistemological theory, it's a kind of just sort of common sense realism. Most, I mean, the thing that it's most similar to, I guess, is the kind of view that Reid had except that I kind of disagree with him about um, the kind of, the, the range of things that we just rely upon, that, um, that we're entitled to rely upon. So uh, if, you, if you think about um, so perception, introspection, memory, uh, testimony, uh, and so on. The, these are the kind of sources of our beliefs. Oh, and there's in, an inference I left out. These are the sources of our beliefs. And in all of these cases, part of what happens as we kind of, as we mature, so as, as we develop into being um, epistemic agents is that we kind of learn when we can trust these various sources and when we shouldn't. And it's particularly important in the case of testimony. Testimony is the biggest source of everything that you believe. Um, there's very little that you believe um, in the sciences, for example, that you don't believe on the basis merely of testimony. Uh, and a lot of what we learn as we're developing as epistemic agents is who to trust, when, in what domains, and so on. But there are some, there are kind of similar things that happen with perception, for example. So with vision, you can, your vision's reliable in, in a range of conditions for a range of things. But it's not always reliable. So if you know it's foggy or smoky, or you've had too much to drink, or I mean, there's a range of defeating conditions, then you know that you can't rely on your vision. And so, if we're thinking about foundations, what's foundational is something like. Um, the use 
that you make of things like perception and introspection and reasoning and um, taking on testimony and so on. It's not, uh, this doesn't really fit, I think, with the Tradeluma talk that you were giving because um, there the idea is that there's kind of somehow or other propositions that kind of, I mean, for a foundationalist, there are these propositions that are just kind of basic. Um, and I don't, I'm not thinking about it like that. I'm thinking about that what's ba basic about is sort of being an epistemic agent with certain sorts of capacities. Does that mean that I'm a kind of coherentist? Uh, does it mean that um, everything, that any anything that you believe is might, might be um, discarded uh, if um, you know the the right kinds of or the wrong kinds of inputs came in. I'm not sure. I don't think that it's inconsistent with the picture that sort of takes capacities or faculties or something like that as primitive, that there may be things that really you just can't give up. So for example, uh, unlike perhaps Quine, I'm inclined to think that the claim that one and one and two is not something that's sort of vulnerable to future experience that you might give up. So that seems, so I'm not sure that that really places me either on the foundational side on or on the coherent side. I think there might be a way to, to reconcile that with a sort of foundationalism in that, look, you have, there's, there's, there's some beliefs you have that aren't um, uh, based on sort of inference from other beliefs that you have, but they're justified by, I don't know, either the sort of, what do you, I mean, experiences or practices or, or, or something else that's, um, non-inferentially supports them. I mean, that's, that's something that um, some foundationalists would yep. assent to. But, maybe that's but, something like that is what you have in mind? Except that their status in lots of cases is going to be revisable. So, you know, my, my, my memories, right, I'm, I'm, I mean, it's fine for me to trust my memories, but not to think that they have any sort of absolute um, authority in in every case. And I misremember things just as I've misperceived things, just as I've made bad inferences and so on. And so um, it's, I mean, so, so there is this thing that yes, uh, at least in the right kinds of conditions and circumstances and so on, it's perfectly fine for me and I should trust my senses and, uh, and so on. But they don't, that doesn't confer on all of them a special kind of status that sort of puts them beyond um, revision or something like that, even though some of the things that are in my web of belief do have that status. Yeah, yeah. I wonder. I wonder maybe if um, uh, Hack's uh, foundationalism is maybe closer to the the view you might be have uh, be expressing here. Though I'd have to think about it some more, maybe. So I'm not. I guess I wasn't. I've never really been concerned about those very high level labels about how to describe the position right. that I've got. And it's also the case that uh, it's one of the less kind of well worked out parts of my view. So um, they're kind of, um, you know, what, what I described was hardly a kind of comprehensive theory. Yeah, I mean, I mean, fair enough. We don't need to um, necessarily be um, concerning our, ourselves with these uh, these sorts of theories to have um, conversations elsewhere. Um, yeah. 
because I, I know there's some people, including some people that um, have, I've like interacted with on this platform, who will say that like unless you have a sort of well worked out general epistemology, um, you can't really say anything um, or be justified in saying anything. Um, you know, I, I know you've talked about presuppositionalism before, but this is something that they'll they'll sometimes say, and you would object to this line of reasoning. Yeah, so uh, I take it that lots of practicing scientists don't have a well worked out epistemology, but you should listen to what they say about their science. I don't say that. Right. So so that 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 kind of view is just crazy. Yeah. All right. I'll move on to another question we had from Fallen God about. Um, so Joshua Rasmussen has a paper from a necessary being to God in which he formulates several arguments in an attempt to bridge the gap between necessary being and sort of uh, a God of theism. And he's wondering what uh, your some of your disagreements are with these sorts of inferences. Um, does it, especially on whether some the necessary being would have to have volitional agency? Um, I guess I guess whether he's wondering what you think about sort of bridging this sort of gap, whether it's um, right. A project. So that's so so maybe this is this is related to the supposing that we go with my idea that there's a kind of initial natural state, but it's necessary. Right. Um, so what properties is it going to have? That's kind of hard to answer because we don't have the physics of the initial state. And so it would just be kind of speculative. But if there is an initial state, um, what exists in the initial state is going to be um, an initial surface or an initial point. I'm guessing probably a surface rather than a point, but um, and there'll be something some field or something distributed over it um or if it's i guess if it's a point it's not really much of a distribution but there'll be some field values attached to it something like that i mean that that's probably wrong because it's probably um the the i mean if for example string theory was right and we kind of had strings in the initial state, then that whole, the way that I just described it would be wrong. The real point is we just have no idea about how to think about that initial state, but it's going to be, it's, it's, it's a part of the, it's a part of the universe. So it's going to have um, some sort of physical characterization. And uh, if we think about what we know about um, agency and mind and things like that they don't appear in the universe to a much 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 later stage right there are organisms with um uh, arrays of say a couple of hundred neurons that appeared i don't know more than a billion years ago maybe uh and somewhere around that point uh we've got the appearance of certain kinds of mental properties for the first time uh, so uh and things like agency appearing for the first time so obviously if what i've just said is right I'm not going to accept the idea that there's um, anything like will or agency in the initial um, necessity, whatever it turns out to be. And you can read back from what I've just said uh, to work out which premises I'm going to not accept in the kinds of arguments that try to get you from necessary being to God, whether the, the, the ones that Rob Coons gave in his 1998 paper or the ones that Rasmus and 
gives in the paper that you're referring to, or there's a bunch of other places, because lots of people try to make these kinds of arguments. One thing I would point to um, that's really worth having a look at is um, the book by Jeff Speaks, fairly recent book, in which he points to all the difficulties of trying to infer anything from the claim that there's a perfect being or that there's a maximal being and trying right. to infer what its attributes are going to be. It's much more difficult than you might think to get anything out of those kinds of descriptions. Yeah, that's uh, the book's called The Greatest Possible Being or something like that. Yeah, I believe. yeah, that's what it's yeah. called. Yeah. And yeah. I think, I think that one's a, a book really worth reading if you're interested in this particular question. Yeah, I remember reading a review or something, but I haven't, I haven't looked at the, the book in much detail yet. But yeah, that looks, that looks interesting. Um, I was wondering, the, another sort of argument, I think William Lane Craig has said something like this, maybe others, that um, the initial cause um, has to be some sort of uh, agent because if it was something else, I don't know, some sort of mechanic, mechanistic cause, as I, I might put it like that, then the sort of sufficient conditions for the um, production of the effect would have, I don't know, in some sense always been present and would have occurred infinitely long ago. Uh, I don't know. And, and so you can only get uh, the cause occurring a finite time ago if, uh, if it was a result of some volitional act. Um, and I know we said something like this. Uh, does that make any sense yeah. to you, or, or what do you think of it? Uh, yeah. Not, not really. I mean, if we're thinking that there's a first thing, then there's a first thing, and there's nothing before it. So the kind of infinitely far ago kind of consideration just disappears. Right? The the necessity right. of the initial state, the way that it's being explained, given the way that I'm thinking about. Um, modality is that every possible world shares that as its origin, right? So it wasn't possible that things start out any other way than there there was this state of, and I'll call it a state of the universe because, I mean, that's kind of the right way to think about it. It's the initial state of the universe. Every poss If every possible world starts out that way, um, then there's no obvious reason. In fact, I mean, there's no obvious reason to think that it's going to have mind or intelligence. There are good reasons to think that it won't. But there's nothing problematic about that, at least nothing that I can say. Right, right. Um, and I know, like, Rasmussen tries to make some argument that it has to have, he has this whole thing about it not having arbitrary limits. Yeah. Um, and then does, does he say something like it has to have some sort of some sort of intelligence or something, and then you get to um, yeah. maximal intelligence? What, what do you so, think about, I guess, in general, that, that principle of like no arbitrary so, limits of this state? Yeah, so, right. so, so, no, so no arbitrary properties, no properties that you kind of have to write in by hand. I think it's a very familiar idea when you can see it in Swinburne, you can see it in Craig, you can see it in lots of people. So in Swinburne's terms, the kind of the magic numbers are zero, one, and infinity. And uh, I mean, there's it, there's kind of awkward questions you might ask about that, but they, but that's the kind of idea about there being no nothing arbitrary. I mean, if you're going to either, either if if we've got a kind of um, what Kuhn calls a metrizable property, if we can attach a kind of numerical value to it, the values that it that that it will be okay for um, the initial thing to have are only going to be zero, one, and infinity. Um, I don't know whether, uh, I, I mean, I don't see why you should think that. Uh, I, I don't have that. Um, I guess I, I, it, it, I, I'm quite happy to wait until physics can tell us assuming that it says that there's an initial state, which it might not do, but suppose it does, for it to tell us what the properties of that state are, and then just to accept that um, it had to be 
that that state had those values or the you know the properties of that state had that had those values or whatever yeah because on on your view it's just whatever the initial state turns out to be whether it's with something with these sort of arbitrary values or limits or not that's what's counting as as metaphysically necessary on yeah on your that's modality. right yeah so Assume, assuming the story about modality that's just how it's going to turn out i don't and that seems fine to me right so i mean it's, it doesn't it's at least not a conceptual fact that the initial state or what's metaphysically necessary would have these no limits or arbitrary values. No, that's, um, that's right. It, it, but it that may turn, turn out to be that way. Right. Yeah, yeah, it might turn out to be that way, sure. Um, and at the moment, we have no idea. That's how it seems to me. But if it did turn out to be that way, one thing you could say, I take it, is that with respect to intellect or agency, it just has that to a value zero. And that's not arbitrary. Yeah, yeah. Right? It, and, and that's non that's non arbitrary indeed. Yeah. All right. So I think to to wrap up, since we don't want to keep you forever, you said you want to uh, go on with your day at some point. Um, I was just wondering, sort of a metaphilosophical question about what what you think the sort of value of philosophy is in general, especially the philosophy of religion. Why, why is it worth doing, and why is it um, why do you why do you find it valuable? I guess. Um, okay, so go back to the picture that I had. There are these questions that we'd like to be able to make progress on. Uh, questions that we don't know how to arrive at consensus answers to. Um, there's something attractive in the idea of actually cracking one of those questions, <laughs> and so you can see what you can see that there's a kind of a genuine reason to be interested in pursuing philosophical questions on the account of philosophy that I gave. Um, it's not all, <laughs> lots of philosophers will not succeed in making much progress towards answer, to, to, towards cracking one of the questions, launching a new discipline, for example, um, or launching a new subdiscipline, finding the methods that will enable us to to reach a genuine kind of independent consensus on questions. So I think that there's value. So I do think that there's value in philosophy. I think in particular that there's lots that we don't understand about religion and that we don't know how to how to go about finding consensus, independent consensus answers to the questions that we currently just don't know how to reach agreement on in connection with religion. And so the justification for philosophy, for doing philosophy of religion uh, just goes along, you know, just follows naturally from the justification for doing philosophy. I do think that there are kind of worries about the way that philosophy of religion is currently practiced, that it's, there are lots of ways in which what we're doing is not particularly conducive to what I take to be the proper goals of philosophy of religion. I'm not alone in worrying about this. Uh, there's kind of increasing um, number of papers and books uh, appearing worrying about the contemporary state of philosophy of religion. I think that's fine uh, because worrying about that might help us to kind of redirect our efforts in areas where we're more likely to make progress. But it's also the case that I quite, kind of quite generally that I think philosophical progress is kind of slow. Uh, and that's just because the questions are really hard. If we knew how to approach the questions, and we're easily able to generate consensus answers on them, then they just wouldn't be philosophical questions at all. Awesome, that's that's wonderful. So we'll wrap up the questions there. Um, thank you so much for, for being here, staying so long to, to take uh, our questions and provide your thoughtful insights. It's been, it's been excellent. Um, thanks for inviting me. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I thought the questions were great. Uh, in some cases, I wish I had um, 
better answers to the questions than the ones that I got. <laughs> no worries. Great. Okay. See ya. <laughs>